Hi everybody, welcome back. So you're gonna be working in this unit with a simulation, and I think you've done this maybe at some point in a biology class, um, but here you see some animals. The gray ones are rabbits, the purple ones are foxes, and you see, I'm resetting it periodically here, and you see that the foxes are swarming over the rabbits and eating them, and the rabbits are having babies and getting eaten. <clears throat> um, and you can see the, the population levels being graphed down here at the bottom. So uh, the big theme of this unit is how programmers use objects to organize information in their code. Um, and this is true for all programs, not just simulations. So School Loop, Instagram, think of any software that you know about, and odds are that the programmers have organized the information by using interacting objects. And that's what you'll get here. You've got a lot of different objects in this simulation that all have to interact to produce some effect. So we're going to have about 10 or 15 minutes worth of review, sort of high-level review, like how do you think about objects? How do you think about when objects interact? Um, and then I'll send you another video that's a link for how do you actually set up this framework. Uh, I recorded all of this live during third block, and it was amazing, if I do say so myself. And then after like 20 minutes, the video crashed and, and didn't get saved. <clears throat> so here we go. If you're into taking a note, you could for sure take a note about this. So stepping back, the, the big picture of all software is programs really at a fundamental level just do stuff with data. It's all about numbers inside variables. Um, so the, the types of data that we have to work with are anything that's inside our variables. So ints, doubles, strings, booleans. And you might be thinking, you know, something like Instagram has pictures. Um, but really at the base, a picture is just a grid of int values. Um, every single pixel is a color, and that color is represented by an integer. So no matter what type of data you have, images, audio, video, at the end of the day, it's all just these basic kinds of data inside variables. So let's uh, think of some examples. Think back to your Arduino projects. Think about what kinds of information did you store inside variables there. And here's what third block said. Third block said, uh, we had button states. And that was an int, zero or one. Is the button being pressed right now? For people who had servos, uh, you needed a variable for the servo position, and that was an int. And there are other examples as well. So that's the kind of data that our program used for our Arduino. If you think about something like school loop, <coughs> zooming out, um, for school loop, there is a lot of different, wait, I'm freaking out. Okay, here we go. Um, so for school loop, there's a lot of different kinds of data that it has to keep track of. Um, here are some things that third block said. So you need like uh, people's student IDs, and you need their names, and you need the names of each class they're taking, and the name of the teacher that teaches that class, and uh, every single assignment name, and the maximum points for every single assignment, and the points that a particular student got for that assignment, and like even more than that. And so each of these is its own kind of basic set of information, so you'd store them inside regular variables. Um, but the issue now is if you imagine a school of 2,000 people where you've got classes and every single class has a bunch of assignments, like how do you organize all of those strings and ints? And the answer is you use objects, you use interacting objects. So inside school loop, you might have an object representing a student, you might have an object representing an assignment, you might have an object representing a class. Like inside the class, every class may have a whole list of student objects. Um, so that's the kind of thinking that you're gonna be practicing in this unit. Here's the big takeaway inside a box. Objects are what you use to organize the data. So, um, on that theme, let's remember like one of the first examples we did with objects. We had uh, sort of fake bank account software. So the data was like we had names for the account holders and we had account numbers and we have the amount of money inside the accounts and we have PIN numbers, which is how people keep their accounts secure and access their accounts. So if we're gonna organize all of this information, we did that by defining a new type of object called an account. And we did that by saying public class account. 
And then we had a bunch of variables that are all related to each other. And those are the variables um, that every single account has. So that's the sense in which objects are used to organize data. Um, you, you know, because you've studied this before, that objects are more than just collections of data. They also provide behaviors. They provide commands that you can use to change the data. But for now, let's just think about them as containers for a whole lot of related information. So the reason this was useful for organization is if we have a whole lot of accounts to keep track of, we can make an, a list of account objects, which we call the vault. And you're going to need to remember all of this because you're going to need to do it very soon. And the way you visualize that was the array list produces a whole bunch of numbered locations. Inside each location is a single variable, a single object. But inside that object is all of the related variables that that object contains. So if I say what's in location 0, the answer is it's an account object. But then inside the account object, we have someone named Walt, and their account number is 1, and they've got $10.23, and their PIN is 1234. Very secure Walt, good choice, um, and so on. So this is like a very simple example, but this is a more organized approach for keeping track of information. So um, I would said just a second ago that objects are not just containers for variables. They also provide commands or methods that let you that let other parts of the code do things with the object data. There's an organizing principle which is that every single object should be responsible for its own stuff. So other parts of the code shouldn't be changing values inside an object. Instead, the objects send each other requests almost. So part of the code might might run a command on an account object and say, hey, account object, could you please make the following change to your data? And then the account object gets to decide whether or not it's going to allow that. So like, that's sort of conceptual. What does that actually look like? For a bank account object, we might have a method called deposit that takes an input, which is how much money to deposit. Or withdraw, which takes an input, which is how much money to withdraw. But remember, I said the bank account object retains the control. The amount of money that we have is a variable inside the bank account. So if like the user interface or if some other part of the code wants to tell a bank object, a bank account object to change the amount of money, maybe it's not just going to provide the amount of money, but maybe it also has to provide the PIN number. And that gives the bank account object control, because the bank account object can check, is this PIN number the right one for the variable that's inside me? And if the answer is no, the bank account object doesn't have to do this operation. It doesn't have to change its amount of money. So that's the idea. Um, it's not just helpful for organizing to have your variables contained inside objects. It also helps keep separate parts of your program from interfering with each other. Only a bank account object is allowed to change the values inside it. And it does that by responding to methods that it provides for other parts of the code. So that's kind of the high level idea. Um, in addition to deposit and withdraw, we might have check balance. Check balance doesn't actually change any numbers inside the account. All it does is it will return information to whoever's asking. Um, there's a name for this, which we've talked about before. It's called a getter method because it lets some other part of the code get the variable that it wants to know about. It lets other parts of the code ask about what the variables inside my bank account say. The other direction is a setter method that would let other parts of the code change the values inside my object. But um, a setter method can have other conditions, like a setter method could take a pin number and only if the pin was correct would the bank account actually let other part of the code make the changes. So that's the kind of high level. And remember, there's inputs in the parentheses. And if check balance is supposed to answer a question, it should have an output or a turn value. And we'll go over all of that again soon. <coughs> Stepping back to our simulator, though, um, let's just look at it again. And you can maybe imagine 
what kinds of interacting objects you think are happening in this simulation. So if I'm looking at the simulation, here's what happened in third block. People immediately said, fox, that's an object. Rabbit, that's an object. And then people weren't too sure, but somebody clever noticed that on the left-hand side of the screen here, it's a list of all of my classes. And these are, in fact, all of the defined objects for my simulation. Oops, let me reset this. So um, fox, you can see here. Rabbit, you can see here. I've got main, which is sort of like the main program that runs everything else. Um, I've also got field. Field is an object that represents this entire field, which is where all the animals live. I've got simulator, which is what actually controls the process of what should the animals do and in what order and at what times. Um, I've got some other helper objects, um, like counter, which just counts up how many of different kinds of animals there are. Field display is specifically the display properties about like what colors should foxes and rabbits display as, how big should the grid look. Uh, graph is my object that is just responsible for all this graph behavior down here. So this is like maybe, I don't know, 10 or so different classes. Um, that's not a very large program. It's pretty standard to have dozens or hundreds or sometimes even thousands of interacting types of objects in a program. And you can see why that's so important. If you have a program that's big enough that you require hundreds of interacting objects, the objects give you a way of simplifying how you think about the program. You don't have to think in terms of individual variables. Instead, you can think about types of objects. So it's almost, so when you're programming, it's almost like you're learning a completely new programming language where the commands are the commands that are defined by these objects. Um, so it's a different way of thinking, but like I said, it is ubiquitous. All software is organized this way. So this is your first chance to get a taste of it. Let's go back to the last part of the notes. So I would said what kind of objects are in our simulation. People said rabbit and fox. So the next step is, all right, uh, what kinds of variables does a rabbit need? If we're going to have rabbits breed and die and get eaten and age, um, they need variables such as are they alive, yes or no. That's a Boolean. And foxes have that too. They might need an age, which is an int. They might need a maximum age, the age at which they die. They might need a breeding age, the age at which they can start having babies. They might need, uh, they might need to know, have a number that's like, how many babies do you have when you have babies? Foxes uh, eat rabbits, so they might need something like a hunger level, like how many years can a fox survive or how many time steps can a fox survive without eating a rabbit. So you'll look in the code and you'll discover what variables define a fox and rabbit, but then there's also behaviors. So both animals have a command called increment age, make babies. Run is, the, is sort of the general command that makes rabbits do all of the things that they do. So that's going to be the first couple of days of our project, is you're going to dig in and understand how do rabbits work, how do foxes work, and eventually you're going to make your own third type of animal, which can fit into the ecosystem however you want. Um, it could eat both foxes and rabbits. It could just get eaten by rabbits. It could eat rabbits but get eaten by foxes. Kind of up to you. Um, but this is going to be your test of do you understand how the whole framework fits together? Can you make another object that you can add into this whole complex framework because you understand what's going on? So that is the project. Um, I'm sorry I had to be gone today. I'll be back soon and we'll talk more. For the moment, it's very important that you actually get your framework set up properly. Um, if you check your school loop email, uh, I sent you a link to the video. The video looks like one of these. Let's find it. The video looks like, well, here, I'll show you. <coughs> so the video is at FHS 2020 Fox Rabbit Setup. Um, it's really important. A lot of people in third block were confused about where the GitHub link is. This is the GitHub link. If you click on it, this is the full link you want. GitHub.com, D. Dobrovich, Foxes and Rabbits template. That's the one that you're going to be using in the video. Um, I'll probably send you another email with that clarification. That's it. Good luck. I'll see you next time.